Micah 5, 2. As for you, Bethlehem, Epaphrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. Let's start here. The location. The location. Critics have said this is not describing a place. It's describing a person. So it's not describing a region or geography. It's describing an individual. And that's true. This, this name can be used for persons in the Old Testament. The citations are there in First Chronicles. This language of Beth, Bethlehem Epaphrathah can describe a person. However, it also is used to describe a place. Genesis 35, 19, Rachel died on the way to Ephrath, Epaphrathah, that is, Bethlehem. Ruth 4, may you achieve wealth in Epaphrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Or, 1 Samuel 17, 12, David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse. This is referring to a place. Now, David comes from this region, and we're reading in Micah 5, 2, a messianic prophecy. Is this referring to a person? Or is this referring to a place? Jewish interpreters have said this is referring to a place. Rashi held to this as a geographical location, and other Jewish interpreters have followed suit. When it says here that this person comes from Bethlehem, Epaphrathah, that's like saying Columbus, Ohio. Bethlehem is the little tiny town, and Epaphrathah is the larger region. It says here, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Wow. So he's going to be a ruler in Israel, messianic. He's from this place. And what's his origin story? Eternity. That's where he comes from. Now, this word olam, eternity, this could either refer to a long period of time, like Jonah is in the belly of the whale for olam. In Jonah is a chapter two. Micah uses the word olam to refer to a period of time, not necessarily an eternal period, in chapter 7, verse 14. However, this word is also used for God's eternal nature. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 90, verse 2. And Micah also uses the word olam in this way, to refer to God's eternality, his eternal nature. Finally, Rashi, interpreting this passage, says that this is referring to eternity. This is not referring to, what does that mean? He's a ruler and his days are from long ago, uh, from eternity. This is a preexistent being, but he's born. Again, just like Isaiah 9. He's a little baby and he's born, but we're calling him mighty God. This was understood to be a messianic uh, prediction from Micah. The context goes on to describe how Messiah uh, protects and defends the nation of Israel. In my view, this hasn't occurred yet. This hasn't occurred yet. This is still in the future. But first, Messiah needs to come. That's his origin story. And then eventually he comes back to defend the nation of Israel. And, and in case you think that's ad hoc, that's the repeated theme that we see in the prophets. Israel surrounded at the end of history. They're hemmed in. They're coming in to kill him. And then the Lord or Messiah or David shows up to defend Israel right before the, the, the 11th hour and, and victory is theirs. That's the repeated theme of the prophets. Did Jesus fulfill this? How do we know this actually was fulfilled by Christ? According to Origen, writing in AD 1, sorry, excuse me, 250. Origen was writing in 250. He said that the enemies of Christianity withheld the teachings of Jesus' birthplace. In other words, the enemies of Christianity by the third century knew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, according to this prediction, but they actually suppressed that information. James, the half-brother of Jesus, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, and John the Baptist, the cousin, question mark, of Jesus, the relative of Jesus, they would have known where Jesus was born because they were direct relatives. They would have had direct eyewitness attestation to this, and yet they wrote letters. They followed Christ, and even Josephus mentions that James was killed 
in Josephus book 20, right around uh, section 197, says that James, the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, was killed. So they would have known. Here's an interesting part. Matthew, again, in Luke, remember we said they're independent sources? Matthew cites Micah 5.2. Luke mentions a census for the entire known world uh, under uh, Quirinius to get Jesus to be born over in Bethlehem because he had to go home in order to give the census. Now, critics go nuts on this. There was no census of Quirinius. Trying to make that fit, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. I've heard all the explanations and it doesn't work. Uh, Luke, what he was trying to do was create a prophecy, or excuse me, he was trying to get Jesus from the place of his origin to Bethlehem, to be born in Bethlehem, to fulfill Micah 5.2. But there's no global census. Here's the problem with that. I'm not going to go into the historicity of Quirinius and that census. Here's the problem with that theory. Luke makes up a worldwide Roman census to get Jesus where? Bethlehem. Okay. So he makes up in his story a worldwide census under Quirinius to get Jesus over to Bethlehem, right? Right, okay. Does Luke cite Micah 5.2 to show that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy? No. Does Matthew cite the census that gets Jesus to Bethlehem? No, he doesn't cite the census. But does he cite Micah 5.2? Yes, he does. So Luke gets us a census that gets Jesus to Bethlehem but doesn't cite the prophecy. Matthew shows that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy, but doesn't cite the census. And let me add one final point. Lydia McGrew makes this point. To invent a census across the Roman Empire to get Jesus to Bethlehem is like trying to crack a, a walnut with a jackhammer. Okay? You could do way better if you're inventing a story than to do it that way. All right, final thought here. Why invent a story of a pregnant, unwed Jewish girl leaving town for the census? Do you have any idea how suspicious that would be? I know in our culture, we just pick up and we get on an airplane and we leave. Or, you know, we go across the country with our, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend. It doesn't matter. It's, our culture is totally alien to the, the New Testament of first century Palestinian world, where to leave with your pregnant girlfriend, fiance, and then leave and then have the baby, that is totally suspicious. And yet that's the story they invented. You actually could have pretty good grounds for saying this was fulfilled.